food, whether it is mobility, and this becomes a powerful uh, consideration for all of us looking forward. Now, in connection with the climate, we know very well that climate change can have impacts and push people back into poverty, although we've managed to draw a lot of people out of poverty in, in, in the last few years. But climate change can push back into poverty. Climate change can lead into greater conflict, and we know all of this. And therefore, whatever ideas we have, have to be system-wide ideas. They cannot be focused on just energy. It cannot be focused on just one part of the world and not the other. It is dear friends, a collective responsibility. Now, despite the uncertainty, despite the worry that you hear from all of us again and again, despite what the science is telling us, there is hope. And you heard some of that in, in the earlier session. There is hope because there are a number of new opportunities that are coming. Dave here will talk about the, uh, the energy technologies that are coming on stream and where the costs are going down and therefore there are the opportunities there. There are the digital technologies which are enabling us to scale up a lot of the work that we're doing. So there are ways in which we can move this forward. And we have a shared vulnerability. I think that is becoming clear. It's very important that the shared vulnerability does not result into nationalistic or regional jingoism, but results in this collective feeling and a collective action that is required, where we all know that all of us are on the same planet and need to be taking collective action towards this. It's in this context and in the new business models that we hear of the sharing economy and of the other technologies that the hope lies. Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement are perfect because they prevent, provide us with the goals and the framework that we need. And it is in the context of these that we see the inclusive green economy as being one very clear movement forward as an economic paradigm towards this. I totally sympathize with the young man, uh, Luis Alvarado, who said, we don't want infinite growth. No one wants infinite growth, but we do need some growth. There's a large parts of the world that don't have that growth. So until the world is a little more equal, we need to have some amount of growth. And when we do have this growth, we need a green economic growth. We need a growth that is sustainable, that takes into account resource efficiency, that takes into account circularity, that takes into account uh, decarbonization. And it is here that we also want to emphasize sustainable consumption and lifestyles. We need to make sustainable lifestyles a global social norm if you really want to change this world. We need to make nature central to our thinking because it's not a by the way thing, you know, think of it as an externality. Nature is not an externality. Nature is central to our thinking and it needs to drive our metrics, needs to drive the way we, we go forward. In the UN environment, we have an inclusive wealth index now, which is really trying to promote these ideas of how to bring the different uh, understanding of of uh, notions of wealth into the same, onto the same page. But being green is not enough. We know that because being green and moving very fast to green without understanding the transitions that are involved, without understanding that these transitions need to be just, then leads it to a world which is not humane. Again, look at my country. We have over a million people directly or indirectly uh, connected with the coal sector. And while we need to move out of coal, we need to make sure that we have the social safety nets and that we have the social flaws that are required to enable this transition to happen. Otherwise, you're having a lot of unhappy people. So in all of this, therefore, we need system-wide transformations. And the UN environment ever since United Nations Environmental Assembly II in 2016 has been focusing on what we call the three Ds decoupling, decarbonizing, and detoxifying, which are severally but collectively very powerful. And this is the agenda that we've been rolling out uh, in the United Nations Environmental Assembly 3, but also moving forward to, to 4, where we're looking at innovative solutions for sustainable consumption and production and environmental challenges. The idea is, how do we scale up? We have the solutions. We have great people around here with, with, uh, with, who are very knowledgeable and very passionate, but we need to connect the dots. We need to bring people and levels together to move this forward. Enhanced ambition is required for the, uh, the carbon budget, as we all know, will be well depleted before 2030 for the two degrees scenario. And we therefore need to start thinking really hard and fast on how do we get there. But can we? We believe we can. We definitely can. We can, but we need to all work together to be able to do that and work as fast as possible. There are six sectors which have already been identified as being able to bridge the gap, and I'm sure Dave will, will talk to that. So 
we are synchronized, and I'm not going to repeat any of the things that he's going to say. But achieving ambition globally, not just in the EU, requires changes in the rules of the game. The rules of the game relate to financing, relate to technology sharing, relate to trade. And that is where we really also need to start doing much more thinking. In UN Environment, we are working with the financial inquiry in order to look at the way in which we can align the financial system with sustainable development. We are looking at the WTO, World Trade Organization, to see how is it the trade and environment can work with each other to promote a more prosperous, resilient, and, uh, and um, environmentally friendly world. So there are these changes that need to be pushed back. The Climate Technology Center is another one where technology is being pushed. So for all this, ladies and gentlemen, we need strategic leaderships and partnerships. I'm not going to repeat what was said in the previous uh, uh, session, but it's very clear we need business leaders, we need financial leaders, and it's already happening. We're working with changing finance, but also financing change. And, but we need much more of that. With regard to business leaders, there is a very recent report from FTSE, uh, Russell report, which shows very clearly that the inclusive green economy is being adopted by a large number of companies, and it's now almost overtaking the fossil fuel sectors in terms of uh, capital, uh, market capitalization. That's great. That's great news to hear, but we need more of it. We need political leadership, and you see that in the European Union, the great political leadership. We need more of that. We need more of the G20 taking political leadership. We need each one of us to be political leaders and really take this agenda forward uh, together, because otherwise we will not be able to, to achieve in, in the time span that we need to. I do believe cities become key to all of this, and our focus on cities is built in terms of recognizing the agglomeration of benefits that we can bring together in the context of city, because city is like an ecosystem, but also the fact that you can do a lot of integration there. Integration from the vertical to the regional to the local, but also cross-sectorally. And again, therefore, the power of pushing things forward together. And therefore, we uh, strongly believe that local authorities and the mayors are absolute champions of the change moving forward, bottom up, top down. You know, I really don't mind where we start as long as we move forward. And non-state actors, as all of us here are, uh, or many of us here are. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to shut up, but thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say my piece. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for this is what I told. It was an inspiring beginning. So we have a good beginning, and now with a further ado, I would like to go uh, to directly to David Turk. And David is acting director for Sustainability Technology and Outlook Directorate at International Energy Agency. And you will focus on the energy, but also you'll extend a little bit. So, David, the floor is yours. I'm hoping it will be same as exciting. And you have 10 minutes, or you actually have 11, because we already saved one. Uh, having the International Energy Agency here today, thank you to our uh, terrific uh, hosts and colleagues with DG Klima, Alina, and her team for uh, an excellent series of discussions already today in the um, panels look um, equally impressive as we go through the rest of the day as well. Thanks to my colleague uh, Lugia for a very inspiring and powerful uh, presentation. I think you lived up to the billing uh, that was presented. Um, and as she mentioned, strategic partners, UN Environment is one of our strategic partners and frankly one of the organizations in the world who plays best with everybody else and looks at the final result um, as the, the paramount concern. So really appreciate all the partnership. Thanks to the terrific first panel as well. I thought the, the speeches and uh, uh, Commissioner Arias Caniete and Jennifer and Bertrand and uh, Alvarado as well. It was really a terrific setup uh, for the rest of the day's discussion. So what I'm going to do is get into the numbers a little bit, um, actually look at the latest figures of what's happening out there in the real world uh, on the energy side of things. As you'll see, uh, some of the numbers are quite sobering and quite daunting, uh, but there are, as Ligia suggests, uh, signs of hope uh, so signs of hope as well. So let's get right into the, uh, the slides. So first, just to um, give you a snapshot of basically the status quo and where we're headed without increased ambition by governments, by businesses, and others. 
Um, what you see here is a mix both of the historic numbers. Now, these are just energy-related emissions, but energy is responsible for the bulk of emissions, so this is a significant uh, percentage of emissions globally. You see both historic emissions, but then you also see what we call our central scenario. This is a status quo scenario, although it does incorporate the nationally determined contributions. So this is not a status quo scenario without at least some ambition in there. What you see, of course, is um, we keep increasing. The emissions keep increasing and actually don't even peak um, in the 2040 time period that I have up on the screen. Now, even here, um, there is some sign of hope and some sign of good news. You see there in years uh, 2014, 2015, and 2016 that we actually were flat. Emissions in energy-related uh, sectors were actually flat for three years running. This is the first time in human history that we've seen flat emissions from the energy sector at the same time that we've seen significant GDP growth. That's notable. That's good news. That's a sign that we are, or at least have the potential to decouple growth, economic prosperity from emissions. Now, the bad news there is 2017 was not a good number. We actually increased emissions. We went up 1.4% uh, in 2017. So we've not decoupled. We've not peaked. We're not heading down. We're actually still continuing in that upward trajectory. So let me then plot uh, next, where do we want to go? That's the uh, title of this session. In some sense, that's the easy question that we've got the Paris Agreement. We've got agreement on the goals of well below two with an eye towards uh, 1.5 degrees. But what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? So here's our answer from the uh, International Energy Agency. This is what we call our sustainable development scenario. This is a Paris compliant well below two degree scenario, but it also incorporates very importantly uh, air pollution reductions, having air pollution uh, deaths, having, have, having air pollution um, risks in the near term. And it also includes universal energy access. So these are all important goals around the uh, world, access, reducing air pollution and climate change in an integrated model. All of these three things are achieved in this model. Now what you see here, of course, is that is a wide gap and an increasing gap between where we're currently headed, the status quo level of ambition, and where we need to go. It is a pretty daunting um, graph just to see those two numbers and the differences between those two. Now let's drill down a little bit in terms of where do we see the potential for these emission reductions, for these reductions in air pollution and achieving energy access. No surprise, certainly, for those who are involved in efficiency. Bertrand got into the importance of efficiency, uh, the solar impulse flight being 97% efficient, and our internal combustion engines, I think it was 27% or something along those lines. Uh, efficiency is 44% in our modeling of what we can cost effectively do to reduce emissions over this time period. Now, just to give you a sense of scale of what that means, that means that we would actually double the efficiency in the world for everything cars, appliances, other kinds of things. That's what it would take in order to get to uh, that 44% number and have efficiency do its share, if you will, of where we need to go. No surprise, renewables is also there, 36%. If you add efficiency and renewables together, that's 80% of the emission reductions just from those two related sets of technologies, <laughs> policies. And we are in the midst of a, a renewables uh, revolution, and I'll get into that in, in, in a few minutes. But you also see that's just 80%. We need to get rid of some of those stubborn emissions in industry and other areas. You see some of the other technologies there. I'll get into CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, with a later slide. So we get the question, um, and since I'm going to be using our sustainable development scenario, where does this stack up compared to other scenarios out there? What we've done is actually graphed out uh, all the well below two, the 1.7, 1.8 degree scenarios out there. And you see the dotted line there is the sustainable development scenario. So what I will be exploring to, uh, explaining to you and, and exploring is a more aggressive on the more ambitious end of well below two scenarios, just to give you a little bit of context as we go forward. Now let's, uh, let's look at um, um, the fuel side of things, the fossil fuel side of things. One of the most sobering numbers that I've seen recently is 81% um, of the world's energy use, the world's energy mix in 1987 was from fossil fuels. So 81% of all energy used in transport and industry, everything uh, was from fossil fuels in 1987. If you fast forward to today, 30 years later, it's actually 81%. So there's been a lot of changes in the world, but the overall percentage of use of fossil fuels is still 81%. Again, that's a pretty daunting 
number, especially when you look at where we need to go. So what you see there are the solid lines for oil, for gas, for coal, are the status quo scenario, the central scenario that we have. And the dotted lines are where we need to go uh, in order to be on that sustainable development track, that Paris compliant track. You see a huge decrease, of course, in coal. You see a huge decrease in oil. Coal already having peaked. Oil um, peaking very soon in that sustainable development scenario. Gas still continuing into the future, albeit less um, than under the, the, the standard. What you see on the right side of uh, the screen there are coal's decreases largely in the power sector. That makes sense. And oil's decreases largely in the transport sector. Of course, that makes, uh, makes sense at all. Now let's get a little bit more granular and hopefully operational. Um, we do a lot of different analysis at the IA. It's all meant to inform policymakers like yourselves about where there's additional ambition to be had. Where can we increase our ambition um, going forward? What we do every year, and we did an enhanced exercise this year, is look technology by technology and um, figure out, are we on track with that technology? Is it doing its fair share to reach that uh, well below two world or not? And we assign for all of these technologies a green, that is, it is doing its fair share. It is, under our modeling assumptions, playing its role for that uh, well below two degree world. Yellow, if it's making some progress but not nearly enough. This is the so-so category, if you will. And then red are those technologies and those sectors that frankly aren't making much progress uh, whatsoever. This is for power, for industry, for transport, for buildings, energy integration. One of the big things we've done this year is um, instead of having this all in a PDF book, it's all an interactive website. So there's no book of this. You can go on to IA.org right on the home page. You can get a link to the TCEP, the Tracking Clean Energy Progress. It's got interactive graphs. You can see how Europe is doing versus India versus China versus global numbers. Break it up in all sorts of different ways. Print out your own slides um, according to what you want. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, to check that out. What you see here is, again, pretty sobering. Um, there's 38 technologies and sectors. If you count up the number of greens, it's four. So four of 38 technologies and sectors are currently doing their share or seeing the kinds of progress, um, as Ligia suggests, the kind of scale that we need to see in order to, to get to that well below two. You see a lot more yellow uh, and a disappointing number of red up there. Now let me just drill into some of these key, uh, some of these key technologies. Here's renewables uh, historically to 2016. Here's the number in 2017. And then here's where we need to be on various renewables um, under the sustainable development scenario to 2025 to 2030. Um, first of all, you see an enormous increase in renewables, especially on the solar PV side of it and the wind side of it um, historically. You also see hydropower is a big part of overall renewables now and even into the future. But what you see here also visually is renewables, even though we're having a revolution in renewables, solar PV in particular, we're just not on track. We're not seeing enough scale of renewables and enough types of renewables um, going forward. Now let's drill down there a little bit. Solar PV is green. It's one of the only, again, one of four that are green in there. You see the trajectory historically, that's the red. The projections out to the next five years um, is the blue, and then the green are the targets. Solar PV is on track. We've seen huge amounts of growth of solar PV in 2017, building on historic growth rates. There's the geographic breakdown. Uh, no surprise to many of you who follow uh, international issues, China's increase has just been huge on the solar PV front. You see not only the increase from 2015 to 2016, but how that compares to some other countries and regions out there. India's um, had a solar revolution, the incredible growth rates we've seen in India um, with some of the, the government policies and private sector uh, activities on that end. Now let's look at some of those uh, renewable technologies that aren't on track. Uh, onshore wind um, is still an incredibly important part. We're still seeing significant amounts of growth, but frankly, we're seeing less growth in onshore wind than we've seen historically. You see the China decreases on that. The EU has been a wind leader um, for many years, and you see that very um, strongly continuing. Last year, in 2016, when we did this exercise, onshore wind was green. We'd seen the kinds of increases, but for the last two years, we've actually seen a decrease in the additions of wind. We're still adding wind onto the onshore wind onto the system, but not nearly at the rate we need to uh, in order to be on track. Here's the hydropower numbers as well, just so you get a, another renewable uh, up there. Let's look at another bright spot, LEDs. Um, cost reductions, the mass deployment schemes, including in India, but other countries have been very impressive. Uh, LEDs, um, for those who don't know this uh, technology, is anywhere from 9 to 15 times more efficient 
um, than uh, incandescent or the traditional light bulbs. You see huge increases to 2017 in terms of how much LEDs, that's the dark blue on the bottom of the screen. This is where it needs to be to 2025, 2030 under our modeling assumptions in order to, to do its share. And it actually is on track. It is actually increasing in those ways. And you see over a relatively short amount of time going from a very small base, 2014 it was only 10%, to the point where LEDs are um, that much, much efficient, more efficient technology, um, the market, uh, market leader in that side. 3.3 billion LEDs installed in uh, 2017. Let's look at electric vehicles. This is another one of our good news categories. Um, you hear the growth. This, these numbers just came out in our annual outlook a couple weeks ago. Um, you see the increases to 2017. That's a 54% increase in the sales of electric vehicles around the world. Again, driven by China, but some of the highest per capita electric, sales, uh, electric vehicle sales are in Norway and Sweden and a number of countries uh, here in Europe. Now, that's uh, 1 million additional sales, 3 million additional, uh, 3 million total electric vehicles out there. 1 million sales is about 1% of total sales. So just to give you a little sense of perspective. And what I'm doing between these two slides is changing the scale. So here's what it looks at 2017. You still see those numbers. They're just infinitesimally small compared to the 240 million electric vehicles we need to get to by 2030 and even more in 2040 uh, in order to, again, have electric vehicles doing its share. So huge growth rates, but we need to have that policy. We need to have that policy certainty, as uh, Bertrand said in the opening session, to really continue to drive that electric vehicle uh, revolution. Now here's another uh, technology. I mentioned CCS at the beginning, and this is red. Um, if we gave different variations of red, this would be dark, dark red uh, in terms of not even close to being yellow and certainly not close to being green. This is uh, industry CCS, one of the industry being one of the uh, toughest areas to decarbonize. We are seeing some growth, but just like electric vehicles, here's the scale of growth that we need to in order to decarbonize some of the industry uh, by 2030 and 2040. And unlike electric vehicles, we don't see that kind of uh, huge increase, that huge percentage increase, the government commitment to it to, to make, it, make it happen. Now let me end with uh, one good news story, and this is actually uh, quite significant. This is a, a graph of research and development investment by governments around the world. How much money are we putting into innovation to drive those costs down, to have the technologies that we need to at the price points we need to? Pretty sobering that uh, since 2012, we've actually seen pretty flat and even in some years a decrease in overall government R&D uh, funding. When we added up the total amount of government R&D funding, you see it's about 20 billion or so. Uh, that's about uh, half of what the top three IT companies spend on R&D, just three companies on R&D versus the global effort on clean energy R&D across the world, just to give you a sense of perspective. 20 billion is a lot, but just to give you that. What we saw in 2017 was actually quite encouraging. We actually saw a 14% uh, increase in government R&D funding around the world, European Commission, European governments helping to lead that, China, um, U.S., other countries as well being very much part of that. So again, that's a good news, uh, good news story. So hopefully um, those numbers have been helpful to give you, again, a little bit of a real world perspective. How are we doing? Where do we need to go? And what's the gap between it? It is a daunting, it is a sobering uh, proposition, but there are signs of hope. And this is the kind of challenge, as has already been referenced by many speakers, that we only overcome if everybody's doing their parts. Governments are doing their parts. Companies are doing their parts. NGOs are doing their parts. Innovators are doing their parts. And just to end with a sense of urgency, the longer we wait to really start seeing this progress to turn more of those categories from uh, yellow and red to green, uh, the more challenging it becomes and all the, the risks that we see associated with climate change. So thanks again for having the International uh, Energy Agency here and more than happy to uh, have strategic partnerships with all of you to try to do our part to be helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. And it was really inspiring. And the good news at the very end of it, it was very op optimistic. And let's hope it's going to be more and more optimistic now in our discussion. Now we have uh, six panelists. And before we'll go ahead, I'll, I'll introduce uh, all our honorable panelists. Uh, we have Montserrat Mir Eroka from Confederation of European Trade Unions. So trade unions is very important role to play as all the workers uh, in the middle of action also. Uh, we have His Excellency Mr. Hector Marcelo Kima, Ambassador of Argentina to European Union. 
we also have His Excellency Ambassador Basso Sanku, uh, Ambassador of South Africa to Kingdom of Belgium. I, I hope I do pronounce the, the, the names rightly. And we have also uh, His Excellency Ambassador Dan Costello, uh, Ambassador of Canada to the European Union. And we have uh, also Mr. This is tricky one, Viva No Naso No. And this Viva No is, is, is um, Assistant Secretary General and uh, from uh, African, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States. And we also have Marcus Beirer. Uh, uh, Director General at the Business Europe. So we will start our panel discussion. We, we have, okay, eight minutes, eight minutes, eight to 10, but let's, let's have it as brief as possible, and then we'll listen also to the floor. And uh, then uh, maybe I can invite, if you would like to, to, to take a no, it's it's okay, and then uh, I will start. We'll start. We'll start our discussion, and uh, if uh, you you can come maybe over here, it will be better. Yes. If you feel better, so please. You feel better having them. <laughs> <laughs> Set now. So that that is great. We're all set now, and we're at the front table. And let's start this panel discussion. And we would start from the trade unions' point of view. And this is very important, uh, I think, as I'm coming also from from the uh, European Economic and Social Committee and trade unions. It's one third as important in our committee. Another one third is business, and another one third is active civil society from all different. Uh, parts of a society. So trade unions are in the middle of a transition and it's up to you also to raise the question of just transition, if I believe. So uh, Montserrat, the floor is yours. And uh, eight minutes, up to 10. Let's say that. Thank you to the Chair and thank you to the Commission for to organize this Talanoa Dialogue. Of course, we as a trade unions, we love this word. We love dialogue and we are always available when we have a counterpart to enter in dialogue and more if it's an inclusive dialogue because uh, the spirit of Talanoa is to integrate as maximum possible stakeholders. I must say that for workers and unions, climate action and social justice must go hand in hand. And we need to build and share prosperity because if not, it's not good for citizens, it's not good for the society. In developed and in developing countries, in both, uh, no one must be excluded. And just transition must be also a bridge uh, to bridge the gap between climate transition and climate action and the decent jobs agenda that very often they go, each one, and they work as a silos. We want a just transition for, for all. And what means that? What means that for unions? We must not forget that we represent, uh, at European level, 50 million workers, and we represent also 10 uh, um, federations, means sectorial workers. Uh, what means? Means to create uh, quality jobs, be a massive investment, and an ambitious policy framework. Means to secure labor transitions through training policies and to ensure that workers will be equipped with the right skills. 
to promote workers' participation and social dialogue, to build consensus and widen the ownership, to provide a safety net, as was mentioned before but, uh, by the introductor, uh, through social protection systems, I repeat, for not let no one behind. And to respect labor rights, to respect the right to be a member of a union, to respect the trade union rights, to respect the right to have social dialogue and collective bargaining. Through the Paris Agreement, countries commit to promote decent work and just transition to the workforce while implementing domestic climate action. This principle should not be forgotten now that we are entering the operationalizing uh, moment of the agreement. In that perspective, we think at the ETUC, at the European Trade Union moment, that the choice of Katowice as the host city of the next COP24 is a good opportunity to strengthen just transition principles at the core of the international climate action. Katowice epitomized uh, with this industry, with his industry, with his background, the challenges and opportunities that we have with the transition to a low carbon economy. And COP24, we as a trade unions will promote that must be the COP of the just transition. Just transition is part though, of the Paris Agreement, is part not only of the preamble, is an integral part of the agreement, and this is the good opportunity, this one, to have the COP in Katowice as a just transition COP. With that objective, we, the ETUC, we call for a high level ministerial with the all uh, trade union movement, with ITUC all, uh, we are calling for uh, a, a, a meeting at the COP between environment and labor ministers to launch a Katowice declaration of just transition and decent work through which governments could clearly, could clearly restate their commitment to base their climate policies on just transition and decent work. And for that, we stress that fighting climate change cannot be left to markets alone Public authorities <coughs> must steer the just transition towards the lower carbon economy. And we must also uh, be together planning an ambitious policy framework, a strong public sector and massive public investment. The priorities very often are reflected in the budget and how you invest in to uh, deliver the ambitious uh, plan. Where do we want to go that is part of this panel? Where we don't want to go? We want to go to a zero emissions wall within this century. And we want that wall to offer a decent job and good life to all. Whatever the country, whatever the sector, whatever the region of the world, climate action will not succeed if it's seen as a source of in insecurity, inequalities. Climate action cannot be done at the expense of workers' rights and social justice. Climate action must strengthen our rights, must lead a just society, and must create a more equal world. Uh, on that uh, evidence, uh, we think that uh, we need to engage all actors in a more choral vision, in a more shared vision. As a trade unions, we also uh, want, and we are doing, work building alliances. We work with NGOs, we work with governments, with companies, with employers associations, and with cities, of course, because our network, our capillarity is everywhere. We as a trade unions, we are present in all companies, in all cities, in all regions of the world. And we have also the capacity to engage our workers, to engage our members, the ones who work in the construction, in the agriculture, in all sectors that will be strongly impacted by the, the, the Paris Agreement. But uh, we think that, for example, targets are important, but they are not a political action. They are a guide, they are an element, no? The transition towards net zero emissions will only be accepted if it takes place in parallel with economic and social model, which makes prosperity affordable to all. Emissions reduction must be the consequence of investment and innovation, as well as a, as a radical transformation in the cons consu consumption patterns. Uh, respecting the limits of the planet resources uh, also uh, in the e equitable distribution of goods and wealth among gender generations. Long-term vision must provide uh, a political vision of the future of the EU economy and cover at least the following dimensions, investment needs, technological developments, skill, 
a skills and trade policy and role of the public services, of course, and in particular, the regional and national governments uh, promoting the public ownership of the energy. We are strongly concerned about the access of the energy, the energy poverty, and we as the trade unions, we are cooperating with other stakeholders in to uh, achieve this uh, problem that our societies have. The ambition, uh, we have considered that binding targets at national level were needed for the EU. The long-term low emission development strategy that the European uh, Commission uh, needs uh, to have more collective ambition and should be for 2050. The ETUC is currently, we, with our members, finalizing our position on this. But uh, we think that maybe the roadmap needs to be reconduct and needs to be readequate and should be revised upwards. The strategy should then deliver a credible emission pathway towards that target. Let's be clear, more linear the, power, the pathway, more, mm, more credible will be. Uh, on capacity building and on how to mobilize our workers, we are working a strong uh, through uh, a project that we have done involving our unions, involving our mm, members in to build the just transition. We have uh, presented um, a project that I have with me. I will deliver later to the commissioner. This is a fantastic guide on how to involve trade unions in climate action to build a just transition. I think that very often trade unions, we are at the forefront, like is the case, and we are trying to deliver the best for our members, for the society, and for the climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Montserrat. It's very clear position, and also I, I can see a lot of enthusiasm at the same time with, with uh, and, and willingness to, to act. And this is the most important. Now, uh, for next, uh, I, I would like to ask His Excellency, Mr. Hector Marcelo Kima, Ambassador of Argentina, to uh, introduce us briefly on the uh, expectations of Telenor dialogue and uh, G20 perspective, if I am correct. So, uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I'm very glad to speak after Montserrat because Montserrat presented the union perspective. I will try to present the developing countries perspective because we are all on the same mess here. and. and and not all of us, we have the same, the same responsibilities. So uh, first, as Argentina, uh, allow me to say that Argentina is contributing only to the 0.7 uh, emissions of the global emissions. Um, although we are suffering in Patagonia an increase of one um, degree in the last 20 years. So Argentina is now suffering droughts, flooding, glaciers receding, and water shortage. Um, so the name of the game for us is adaptation. And that is more or less what we would like to uh, stress during the G20 meeting. During the G20 meeting, we created a climate sustainability working group. And the idea is to relate adaptation to job creation to job creation and, 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 and to development. Let's say how we, can, how we can adapt focusing in development, how we can create a long-term low uh, greenhouse house emission society focusing on development, how we are going to align the finance support to developing countries focusing in development because the idea is to create jobs in the, in the, in the transition to the new society. So uh, the question that, that we need to answer is how we get there. So we have basically three answers, and this is as Argentina. The three answers as we need to have NDCs transparent, accountable, and comparable. And we also need dialogue, as, as Montserrat mentioned. Uh, but the, the dialogue also needs leadership. And this is something that Lisha mentioned. Um, um, Lisha mentioned three things, trade and environment, uh, transfer of, of technology, 
and financial support. I think that that is the key for all this. Um, I have to tell you, I, I was ambassador in, in WTO for the last two years. I don't see any, any progress on trade and, develop, and, and environment in WTO. So maybe we are full of words, but we are not implementing what we want to implement. So the G20 will be the next step. I hope that uh, leadership uh, from developed countries will be a, a sign of the times in, in, in Argentina, and we will see how we can go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Dari, uh, Dari, again, encouraging at the same time uh, speech and a good introduction to, to this. Now, from Latin America, we're we shifting a little bit to, to Africa, and I'm, I'm very pleased uh, also to, 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 to give a floor to you, um, Your Excellency Ambassador Basso Zanku from South Africa. And also, uh, within your speech, you, you, you'll tell about the African perspective, but also you, you, you'll touch the adaptation aspect of the climate. So the floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, my name is Basel, and uh, uh, I want to keep it like that because uh, the, the last name will uh, probably break your tongue. <laughs> so it's Sam. So you'll have to, to work very hard on that. And, um, and thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here uh, to have been requested to be part of this uh, panel. Um, and um, as you have said, Mr. Moderator, uh, my task will be to share a bit of uh, what um, Africa um, has to say in terms of where do we want to go. Um, um, and, I, and, and as I do that, I will touch on, on the question of adaptation. We really, I must first um, indicate that we appreciate this opportunity to participate in this uh, European Union's high level event on the UNFCCC's Telenoa um, um, dialogue. When I was reading up about Talanoa and then the concept, it very much resonated with uh, what we would ordinarily do in South Africa in terms of, and I think in most African countries, in terms of trying to deal with uh, what may seemingly be uh, intractable uh, challenges uh, that we face, sit around the table, uh, around the crawl, and call everybody and, and ensure that um, everybody's voice counts in this dialogue, and I think it is important as we go towards uh, uh, Poland that uh, everybody's voice must count um, outside the formal negotiation track and um, building into what is happening in the formal negotiation so that uh, the voices of millions and billions of people around the world uh, will be heard. Um, as well uh, in, the, in the negotiations. So we really much um, appreciate this. And um, we, uh, South Africa will be uh, having its own national uh, Talanoa dialogue uh, event in, uh, later in the year. And we really much again would uh, express our appreciation to the EU for their support uh, to have this event uh, um, uh, possible. I'm uh, particularly honored, as I've said, uh, to be asked to share with you some of the key messages that the Africa Group and South Africa have thus far contributed to the Tunnel of dialogue, dialogue towards a goal we share with the EU uh, on the need to accelerate climate action and enhance and raise the level of uh, our collective uh, ambition. I think over the years, and uh, I think particularly now, Africa is um, uh, making bold of these um, uh, uh, key statements that I will be making. Number one, that uh, we seek uh, to see the world where the global aggregate temperature increase is contained uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius rather than 2 degrees Celsius. And certainly not the far higher temperatures projected on the basis of the current inadequate levels of global ambition. This position is also informed by the reality that the 
temperature increases tend to be significantly higher at a sub-regional level in, parts, uh, in some parts of the continent than the global aggregate. Indeed, uh, Africa countries are already amongst the worst affected by climate change. Uh, my colleague from Argentina was saying we are all uh, uh, in this uh, messy situation. Um, I, I could say that Africa is even in the, the worst messier uh, situation because we bear the brunt of the effects of uh, climate change. Um, we need to reach a place where decisions at the, end, at, at the UNFCCC are truly based on best available science, as well as differentiation and equity considerations. Africa therefore regards the special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, on the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal as one of the key inputs into the Tana dialogue guiding future action. Africa also premises its negotiating positions at the UNFCCC on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities and equity and looks to the developed countries to show leadership. Much as we accept that uh, what has been said here by our keynote speakers, that uh, all of us must uh, act together um, in dealing with the effects of climate change, we must underline the fact of the historical, historical account and uh, that uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities is very key as we move forward. And that must be taken fully on board. Part of the answer to where we want to go uh, post-2020 rests on what it is possible to achieve pre-2020. The guiding questions that the Talanoa Dialogue have an inherent pre-2020 characteristic as parties are required to, to take stock of where we are by the time of the COP24 uh, of COP, of COP uh, COP in December 2018. Towards meeting the global goals in the Paris Agreement and corrective actions need to start now. It is therefore necessary for the dialogue to take stock of all the implementation gaps whether on the issue of mitigation, uh, adapta ad adaptation, or developing countries' uh, specific issues. The burden of those gaps should not be transferred to the post-2020 phase. Africa requires the full implementation of all aspects of the Paris Agreement, which means that the Paris Agreement uh, uh, work program, which is currently being negotiated at the UNFCCC, needs to find the right level of detail and guidance for each topic to allow for implementation. Africa hopes that the exchanges taking place under this dialogue in parallel to those formal negotiations will build trust and add impetus to the evolution of the multilateral response to climate change under all pillars in the convention. The Africa's contribution is focused on adaptation. Since this is one key priority, and an area where science, policy, and action has traditionally lagged behind mitigation. African countries regard the global goal on adaptation as one of the cornerstones of the Paris Agreement. The establishment of the global goal, as well as associated adaptation provisions in the Paris Agreement, are significant steps taken by the international community towards achieving material, material parity between mitigation and adaptation. And therefore, we're seeing that the global adaptation goal is important as it aims to enhance ad adaptive capacities, strengthen resilience, and reduce vulnerability to climate change. It recognizes that stock taking at both national and global level is essential to track impact and progress towards adaptation planning and implementation, particularly in developing countries. And therefore, this adaptation goal is also implicitly linked to the temperature goal, since any given temperature scenario has particular implications for the level of adaptation action that will be required. Furthermore, adaptation actions, particularly those undertaken by developing countries, should also be recognized as a contribution to the long-term global response to climate change. Consequently, Developing countries' mitigation efforts, as well as their efforts to adapt to climate change, 
with their own resources should also be recognized as a contribution to the global action and global effort to address climate change and be seen as part of this dialogue and other stock-taking exercises. And therefore, even as we say that uh, developed countries must show leadership in terms of um, adaptation, we are saying that we as developing countries, in particular as Africa, we are ready to um, take action uh, towards adaptation. But key to this, as we all know, and this is my final point, uh, is, and this is a central message uh, from Africa, is a question of means of implementation. Uh, whether is this is in a form of finance, uh, whether this is in a form of uh, technological transfer and capacity building. This is key to unlocking ambition and action in developing countries without these means of implementation being made available to developing countries, even with the best effort and with the best intentions, developing countries will simple, and most African countries, not have the wherewithal uh, to implement uh, adaptation actions. We therefore need to reach a point where we have detailed information on both the means of implementation and support provided. The hard looking aspects of fin on financing in line with Article 9.5 uh, 9 of the Paris Agreement is critically important to provide assurances that developing countries can make their climate uh, change plans and raise their ambition with confidence that indeed support will continue to be forthcoming in the future. As I conclude, uh, we believe that uh, this innovative uh, a platform that has been created by the Fiji Presidency, Taranoa, is quite uh, very useful um, and, a, and a very important one. And we commend um, the EEO for coming on board. And as I said, uh, we in South Africa, we would uh, be also hosting our own event later on. Thank you very much. <laughs>
ambitious, credible, transparent action, and so we're all working together towards that. But I think the question for this panel, the question posed, where do we want to go, is a broader one. It's a general one, and it's, uh, it's one that, um, in, in our experience, has been very useful uh, to building national consensus. It's, it's, uh, so my first point is, is on the importance in addressing this question of engaging all key stakeholders, especially non-state actors. Um, and so for us in Canada, we know it starts at home. Uh, we have posed this question and been through, uh, in the last few years, uh, extensive, an extensive do domestic process with subnational governments, with cities, with national indigenous groups, with the business community and labor, labor groups, with civil society, and, and especially with young people who have the most at stake here, um, to develop a shared vision of the future. And, and then on the basis of that shared vision, a plan to get there. And so the result is, of course, our pan-Canadian framework uh, on clean growth and climate change, the first such framework in our, in our history, um, which in, in short, the, the vision we came up with is we want to transition to a strong, diverse, competitive economy that fosters job creation with new technologies and open trade and assures a healthy environment for our children and grandchildren. Pretty simple, but nonetheless important that to frame all the work that we've been doing since in part through four working groups that we struck, uh, one on clean tech, one on mitigation opportunities, one on carbon pricing, and one on adaptation, uh, which allowed us to come together as federal and provincial governments in Canada to adopt this pan-Canadian framework at the end of 2016, which is the basis uh, of our action going forward. It, this, this framework is founded on an agreement to put a price on carbon. Uh, so in Canada, we're, even though many of our provinces have had carbon pricing schemes for many years now, uh, we'll now have a national price, uh, $10 a ton this year, moving up $10 each year to $50 a ton by 2022. We feel this is, for us, a critical market signal to the private sector, uh, for investors, uh, and for the innovation we're going to need uh, to get to our goals. Um, We've also developed together as part of this process a mid-century strategy scenario uh, where we're looking, uh, you know, what, what's, what is the scenario for 80% reductions of, of uh, emissions by 2050? Um, and that is, uh, we've, we've started to flesh out a vision for, you know, what, what it would look like, a, clean, a cleaner, more innovative economy, a non, where non-emitting electricity is powering uh, most of our transport, our heating, our appliances, where um, we're maximizing opportunities for energy efficiency, as we've seen, uh, we're, we're, we're successful in our focus on the high potential gains in addressing methane, in addressing uh, HFCs and black carbon, where uh, we're able to preserve, uh, make big efforts, big strides to preserve our, our natural assets in Canada that can act as carbon sinks, and that we're really making great gains from cutting edge innovation and better technology that will also help us in our efforts to improve resilience. And so these are guiding aspirations, but I think they're important to engaging everyone in a common cause. And that's, that's been our experience, and that's how we want to engage um, abroad when we, we do so as well. The second point I wanted to raise is that it's been made, but it, that emerges directly from this question, I think, is, uh, as Mir has said, it's the importance of the just transition. Um, that, for us, I mean, it, it means we, we do have concerns. Canadian workers have concerns. We need to find... Uh, ways to get ahead of the changes that are coming, that the, we need to figure out how to support uh, with skills, with training. Uh, uh, workers need to be able to seize the opportunities that are there in the transition to a lower carbon, a cleaner economy. Um, so there's much to do. One, one example in Canada is that we've launched a national task force uh, for uh, Canadian coal power workers and their communities to talk about these issues. Um, but we know this is an issue not just in Canada. Of course, it's an issue that we have to bring into our discussions uh, internationally. Uh, and across the developing world, we have to be clear that we remain committed with other donors, public and private, to meet the $100 billion climate finance goal by 2020. We are um, you know, currently delivering $2.65 billion in Canada to developing countries, $900 million already specifically uh, committed, um, and this is about the transition we know we need to sustainable, resilient growth. The third and last point I think that emerges for me, for us, from this question is the importance of leadership and cooperation, as you said, um, internationally under the Paris Accord, but also in, in all manner of complementary measures that are possible. Paris, of course, we know provides the benchmark, the foundation, the global, if, uh, for all of our global efforts that are going to get us to the transition we need, and that's why the rule book uh, is so important as we go ahead. But we know, too, that we, we need to do whatever we can, wherever we can, uh, and, and as much as possible with additional steps to transform our economy and our society to uh, cleaner growth. 
And so um, that's where I think, for example, of alternative groupings like the Powering Past Coal Alliance, where Canada and the UK and 60 other partners in government and business and civil society are working together on the best ways to, to move quickly on a sustainable phase out of coal power. I'm thinking of efforts in complementary international fora, like uh, at ICAO on, on aviation, like at the IMO on maritime, uh, or I think of the Kigali Amendment on HFCs. Um, and I think of the, all the opportunities ahead for momentum in the international calendar, from the Petersburg Dialogue to the MOCA here uh, uh, very, very soon. Uh, right, Yvonne, you know about that. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be hearing about it. Uh, the gathering in California with non-state actors, the opportunities for us to mobilize together uh, you know, high ambition uh, coalitions to keep the focus on collective action, and that's, that's the key. Um, so that we can support uh, everyone going forward together and assure success, not just in Katowice, but uh, over the time frames we're really talking about. Uh, so uh, with that, I want to congratulate the EU for its leadership and, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we move to, to, to the African, Caribbean, and Pacific group of states, and we, we have uh, representative Mr. Viva No Naso No. Uh, I'm, I'm very good at names now. And uh, your perspective also will be linked to, to a little bit more ambitious and disease, and uh, so the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, and again, thank you for the effort you have put in pronouncing my name. Um, and as an SCP, as an SCP group, uh, for those who do, who do not know us, the SCP, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific group of states, is an intergovernmental inter group of states, 79 countries, uh, which are among the most vulnerable one when you talk about uh, climate and environment. We have among our, our group uh, 37 SEEDs, small island developing states, 48 less developing countries, and 15 landlocked countries. So when we talk about vulnerabilities, we are talking about those while being the less contributors to the climate uh, situation in which we find ourselves now, uh, the ones suffering the more or more and more recurrent adverse and uh, severe uh, adverse weather impact. Uh, we know about our countries in the Caribbean, the Pacific, but also I think the Ambassador of South Africa also highlighted the severe droughts uh, in the southern eastern part of Africa, but also in the Sahel. So we're trying as a group to see how best we can accompany our countries. Uh, but allow me first to really see how proud we are to have seen how Fiji, one of our, of our member states, have conducted, is conducting the COP23 presidency, uh, trying to bring our actors together uh, through this Talanoa dialogue. And actually, one of the Pacific ambassador was just telling me during the break that when he was hearing the call for action, he was thinking that it will defeat the Talanoa, because Talanoa in the Pacific region means dialogue. So we need action, but we need also to, to have dialogue about the action. So I think Listen to what has just been said, we are back on track because we are still back to the dialogue. What we're trying to see at ACP level is to see how we can really accompany our countries, which we, despite the situation I have just spoken about, have put a lot of emphasis uh, designing the NDCs, first at the INDCs, but the NDCs, of course, part of them are conditional, uh, linked to the availability of resources, but they are committed at the highest level uh, we have seen that uh, 73 out of the 79 SCP countries have the INDCs and the NDCs. Actually, we have even seen that since the adoption of the Paris uh, uh, Declaration uh, ag Agreement, we have six countries which have also uh, renewed or updated the, the, the NDCs uh, to increase the ambitions, uh, even though we, we are in the situation in which we are. So what we are really doing is to see that we uh, keep what we keep calling the, uh, and what is have been ad admitted in the UN since 1988, the right to development. We have the right to development, but of course we are also conscious of the fact that we have committed uh, to the climate. 
we are doing so because we think that if we, we, our people deserve that we bring the appropriate attention to the needs that they have. We are talking about energy uh, earlier. Uh, it is clear that when you go to certain village in our countries, they will not like to know what kind of energy you are bringing to them. They just need energy. But as policymakers, it is our duty to ensure that while we try to get the energy to those villages, we ensure that we use, I think Mr. Pika was saying it earlier, the most cost effective and available clean energy that we have now. And this is part of our duty as a CP group of state. We're trying to see uh, as a platform how in our dialogue with the, with the main donors or the development actors, we can ensure that the available resources I use through uh, uh, the appropriate channel to f factor into our national policies the use of clean uh, instruments in, in where we are trying to achieve our, our development goals. We are saying so because if we do not use that platform, uh, we will, nobody will be here to serve as buffer to our, our government to be able to explain to our, our, our people that we are trying to respond to their need, but we, are, we have to do so because we have other commitments. So that's the, how we are trying to, uh, to help our countries. And where we are trying to, to, to reach is the situation where we may be completing what uh, Lydia have said about the three Ds, which is accepted. We may need to add a, four, a, four, a fourth D. The, the development. I know it's somehow included in the decoupling growth, and but we may insist somehow to have a, a fourth D added to the three Ds, so we can always keep in mind that what we are trying to commit or to deliver on our commitment, we have to do so uh, having in mind our, our right to development. We are also trying to reach a situation where uh, we can have a widespread uh, delivery of the new technologies which are available. We talking about uh, the mean of implementations. Of course, we're talking about adaptation. Uh, as I said, mitigation, of course, is on the radar, but uh, due to our situations, uh, our focus will be mainly on adaptation and, also, of course, also on loss and damages, those kind of things which we think have, we have to work on to be able to respond to the situations for our country, to keep them committed to the process, because it's not an easy, easy thing. When you have such countries like ours, uh, where we are saying we have uh, uh, on the daily uh, issues to deal with, with uh, poverty, uh, with needs to, I mean, with uh, some, even some crisis in terms of nutrition, but we have to commit also to the fact that we don't follow the same pace of development as some have, have, have done prior to us. So we are in the, in the process of trying to maybe repeat what we have been able to, and then again, we are proud of having done that in Paris with the EU, uh, where we have been able to have this, what we call the, the, the high ambition coalition, where bringing together our 79 countries and the 28 EU countries, we have contributed to the breakthrough in the Paris negotiations, uh, not only because we are trying to, we were trying to reach an agreement, but because we think as a platform representing so many vulnerable countries, it is our duty to ensure that we, we did not leave Paris at that time without a clear agreement. Of course, we all say we have recognized it was not the perfect one, but what we kept, we are, we are a bit of, we get a bit of pride convincing EU member states to ensure to defend the inscription of the 1.5 degrees in the, in the, in the text. Uh, for those who were in Paris, it was not uh, something which was uh, obtained when we reached Paris. So this is part of the, what the, the kind of things we managed to, to obtain. But now, looking at what they, uh, or we are looking forward to see what the IPCC report will tell us in, uh, when it comes in October. I think that's what we are, we, we are looking forward to see. Of course, we all know somehow the content of it. So what we're trying to do now is to uh, call upon our, our partners to see how best we can try when we are working with our member states to see the commonalities of our NDCs. What we're trying to do with them is to, to, to 
be able to report to say most of the ACP countries, for example, we have started a study which we uh, hopefully will be uh, completed by uh, end of June, early July, where we should be able to see, to tell the, the, the people what is the commonalities in the ACP countries, NDCs, uh, 79 vulnerable countries. We, are, we can already tell you that we know that um, most of the prominent mitigation sectors are energy, 73 countries, uh, roughly 92 percent uh, are focusing in terms of mitigation on energy. We can also say that adaptation is really prominent uh, with agriculture, uh, 71 percent. Uh, 71 countries have put emphasis on agriculture, representing 75, 77 percent followed by water, by water disaster risk management, 60%. So why we are doing that? Because we think unless we have this kind of, uh, of, of figures, we will not be able to channel the, the support to the appropriate sectors and to have what we can call the, 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 the scale effects where we can, using the minimum means, but uh, reaching out to the maximum effect and impact. So we trying to do that. We will be happy uh, when this uh, study is complete, is completed to, to publish, to, to, to make it available for all the community, and then to, at that time, to, to call upon all of you to see how best we can uh, come together and help our countries to respond to these uh, challenges. So this is what we can say for now, and I will be happy to, to, to contribute and to tell more if you need more from us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And now uh, for the end of this panel uh, discussion, I would like to, 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 to ask, and we have an honorable guest also from the uh, business side and for, from the business Europe, uh, Marcos Beirer, Director General. And also we should be discussing not only the, the willingness, but also some sort of maybe enabling environment, or maybe some sort of regulatory inputs also. So Marcos, any ideas in this kind would be very welcome. Well, thank you, Chair. Good morning, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, well, I think, uh, first of all, also thank for this conference. I think it's very timely, because this is a crucial year. It's maybe the most crucial year since 2015, when we agreed on the Paris Agreement, because this year we have to have a look on what is the progress we made and uh, draw conclusions. And uh, I think it's already clear, if you look at the figures, that more will need to be done. And uh, this is something... Uh, we agree with uh, if we want to reach uh, the ambitious Paris goals and stay uh, below the 2% degrees of warming. Uh, we have had a good introductory statement by the, by the Energy Agency and, and uh, we have seen some figures, some encouraging ones, some preoccupying ones. And uh, I would lose another figure from the agency, which is that we would need 3.5 trillion uh, dollars of investment needed until 2050 every year in the energy sector only to reach the goal. I mean, it's an enormous figure. Um, we try to deal with it. Uh, this means a doubling of the current rate of investment. But let me underline that business is European business community, to be more precise, is fully uh, committed to this process. Has been mentioned as well that R&D is crucial. So, so I, would, I would encourage you all to help us achieving that the budget the European Union will be finally adopting on research to Horizon Europe uh, will be as large as possible. I mean, we would have expected more, but we acknowledge that this is one of the only fields where the Commission has proposed more money together with use. So we think this is important, but we will have to defend it because there's still a big fight out there with member states. So I think every hand uh, will be welcome because this uh, will be a crucial trigger. But let me come back to the investment. So I talked about these enormous figures. Why aren't we seeing this, uh, these figures now? And why is this investment not happening? So, well, when I go around the world talking to my peers, uh, one of the key reasons everybody is mentioning is the, the lack of direction, which is at the time being still given by the parties. And to give you a clear example is the slow progress on the Paris rulebook. Of course, we need to have clarity, and of course, companies need to have clarity, and business community needs to have clarity to know where this whole thing is going, because it's very important to see how uh, to de describe what should be part of the climate pledges, to see how parties report, to see how compliance will be monitored. So all these things 
are very important because without this, there's little assurance where it will be going. There's little accountability and there's little transparency. So, so we would see this as crucial because otherwise you will have double counting, you will have all kinds of effects and then of course uh, the incentives will be lower uh, than they could be because all these uncertainties of course hinder investment. Uh, so we will need some level of certainty soon uh, in order to unlock the trillions of investments we need from the public sector and of course very much uh, from the private sector. So like everybody, we all try to give a perspective and I think this has been well managed uh, uh, by the organizers. Uh, so I'll of course try to give the perspective of European business. And we see three layers uh, of enabling frameworks to make the necessary investments. So the first one is the Paris rule book and I've just talked about it and we were happy to hear that G7 leaders apparently agreed collectively that uh, there should be a deal on this uh, no later than COP24. Um, let me also say that, I mean, I think trade unions, you had your meeting in Canada, we had our B7 meeting in Canada. Uh, we thought our Canadian friends were organizing this brilliantly and they also were brilliant hosts. So this was, was very good meetings and, and very good, uh, very good organization. Um, so let's hope that this G7 deal will hold. I mean, at least I have not seen any objecting tweets in the last days, so it might be that we, uh, that we, we can count on this. I mean, uh, at least I, I hope so. Because I think we really need to, to bring this forward no later than uh, COP24 in order to have the clarity. And, uh, and of course, we need to see that parties are willing and able to agree on this, because if we're not able to agree on the rule book, uh, how will we agree on other issues? going forward. The second layer we see is, of course, this very dialogue, this Telenoa dialogue, this Fiji-style dialogue, which we think is, is crucial uh, because, as I said it earlier, I mean, this is the year we'll collectively assess uh, what is the progress we made. And, and, well, as I said, I think it's very clear what will be the outcome of this process. I mean, it will be acknowledged that some progress has been made and it will be underlined that more progress needs to be made needs to be done, and, and looking at the figures, we fully agree. I mean, we had 60 metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030, and we would need 30 to 50 uh, to reach the two, uh, two degree scenario, so, so there's still uh, work to do. Of course, looking at these figures, the question for me as a business person is, where is the most gains to be made? And, and I have, of course, the habit to look at marginal cost curves and cost benefit ratios. So when I look at the shares of emissions in the world, I mean, I see that Europe currently accounts for 9%, already low, and I look at Yvonne, I mean, uh, Dan has talked about leadership and EU leadership, and I think Yvonne is one of the, of the personalized uh, leadership points on this, so, 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 so I would agree. Uh, so we had 9%. If I put the fast forward to 2030, if we do the calculation looking at the uh, at the pledges we have at the table at the time being. So European share should be around 5%. Um, China, even if they uh, fulfill what they pledged, I mean, this will be still around 26%. And the, the, the US and India will be around 8%. Well, I mean, I think we cannot be sheer, sure whether the US will reach this 8% given some of the policies we see in the market, but anyhow. So it means that 95% will happen outside Europe which doesn't mean that we need not to do something. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I think we are very committed to this process. And we have made it clear also when the US stepped out in Marrakesh that, that we are committed to our targets. But it means that 95% of what is, needs to be done uh, needs to happen outside Europe. So therefore, we need to go work together with other allies. And I think G20, and it's very important that Marcelo is here, G20 is, of course, a crucial platform because this is where 80% of the, of the emissions happen at uh, some of the G20 countries. So I think in Europe we have achieved a number of steps forward. Uh, of course, we still look at ways how to speed up uh, phasing out of coal, using gas as a bridge technology. It's very good to see that renewable energy is becoming more cost competitive, uh, starting to play its role very important. We've just reformed the ETS, the EU emission trading system, which I would say quite an impact on the carbon price and we expect it to go up further. Uh, but again, looking at the figures, we will need convergence in the climate emissions globally because first, I mean, of course, this would bring us more in the direction of a level global playing field for business, but of course, 
it is uh, beyond this crucial because otherwise we'll not uh, achieve uh, the Paris goals. The third point is of course the dialogue between non-party uh, shareholders, stakeholders uh, with the parties, business, civil society, trade unions, and so on. And this is crucial. And we think, if you look at the investment necessities, I mean, it's very clear that the, the hugest part, of course, will have to come from business. So therefore, we think it's very important to, to build a recognized business channel, to institutionalize this dialogue, and to make the input uh, even more tangible than it has been in former conferences, because you know how this is in conferences. Normally, you have all these side events, nobody has time. So I think we will need to have a more formalized approach uh, to this story. So I can assure you that we will continue to work on this. Um, for the next months, we will be working on a new long-term vision on energy and climate uh, to take a lot of things into account which have happened in between and our last uh, big work on this. Uh, we'll be keep pushing on the Paris rule book because again, I mean, without this, it will be very difficult. And I think everybody will need to make concessions. And I know that, I mean, this is the tricky point because nothing is agreed before everything is agreed. But from our point of view, if we can agree on transparency, on inclusiveness, and on the finalization of carbon markets under Article 6, uh, I think then there is other points where, where many should be should be flexible and, and I hope that this will happen. And of course, we'll be working uh, together with the Polish presidency and our Polish friends uh, for this major economic business forum uh, for the next conference uh, and also to talk about this formalized uh, business channel. So to sum it up, uh, I think it's clear we are committed. We also see this uh, first, the Paris Agreement and all the follow-up things as the single most important tool and if we implement it well, it can also be a driver for jobs and economic growth. Of course, we need to handle the transition. I mean, Montserrat has talked about this. We have a number of chats amongst uh, us and the trade unions. Uh, and I think this is the direction we have to go. And it is a moment where, of course, whenever uh, there was a moment where developed and developing countries need to work together to, to, to achieve this goal, I think, I think this is the moment. Some will still have to make up their mind whether they want to be one of the global business leader or developing country, but I think we all need to work together on this in order to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. So now we are coming to this, our second exercise. The first was the Twitter, but keep on tweeting. And the second will be the questions and, and your ideas, and I would like to see who would like to take the floor. We have already two of the, so we'll start from a uh, gentleman over here. You just press the button and two minutes each, please. And if you have an uh, exact question, please say to whom. Hans Kakina, Greenpeace, good day. Uh, I have two quick comments uh, which for us are very crucial. We've been hearing this morning from the Commissioner and now from Mr. Bayer as well that uh, the EU share is only around 10%, so let's look at others to do their share. Well, Europe since 1750 has created the industrialization based on exploiting fossil fuels and burning fossil fuels, so Europe bears the main responsibility for historic emissions. We have to bear that in mind. The second point is the ever-increasing externalized emissions due to importing goods and services, mainly from uh, East Asia, which do not account on our balance sheet, but which occur in China and other countries. So I think there are two crucial points when we talk about emission reductions. We need to factor in our historic emissions and the externalized emissions of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Hello, good uh, morning. Thank you very much, Chairman, for giving me the opportunity. I am Mukun Bhagwat from Aurubis, the largest recycler of copper, contributing to both climate change as well as uh, circular economy. The question which I have is, how can we encourage procurement of, for green investment? So how can we invest in a green way by procuring products which are made in a sustainable way? Uh, how can we make it compatible with WTO rules? Thank you for uh, giving comments on that. 
We will take a number of questions in a row. So I, I, I've seen three questions over here. So let's go over here. Uh, the, the, uh. Thank you. Uh, I would like, first of all, to uh, thank uh, Commissioner Cagnete for having invited the Gabon's embassy to this high level discussion and congratulate all the panelists for their presentation. Uh, I would like to ask for your favor because um, we have a declaration that we would like to make here. And pursuing my intervention, I would say, Gabon, my country, like the entire African continent, support the Talanoa dialogue. I would like to share uh, Africa's ambition, including Gabon's ambition. We are here, in fact, to advocate these ambitions from African countries and from Gabon as well. Uh, His Excellency Ali Bongo Ndimba, serving chairperson of the African Committee of Head of States and Government on Climate Change, and president of the, of the Ministerial African Conference on Environment is engaged on paving the ways in the field of environment which is important for the future of our planet. Raise the voice of African vulnerable states like it was mentioned by uh, the panelists here. On several occasions, he has invited the international community to urgently implement Paris commitment. Therefore, the present vision for Africa lies on the implementation of climate policies integrated to the continental policy of sustainable development as issued in the African Union 2063 agenda, which stresses on the implementation of African initiative, the adopt the adoption of the African in, in institutional policy on climate change for better coherence, the adoption of a financing strategy to mobilize resources. It goes without saying that this strategy cannot be achieved with the help, uh, without the help of international community. This fight against climate change against the consequence of climate change should be not left to Africa only, which is not the only polluters. I beg your pardon. Annulling its vulner vulnerability, the African continent launched the African Initiative for the Adaptation, which requires a budget of $5 million. To achieve this goal, President Ali Bongo Ndimba has launched a campaign to mobilize the required fund of which Gabon has already contributed to 10% of the budget. In this perspective, uh, Gabon will organize alongside the UN session in New York next September, a round table of stakeholders to make this initiative effective. It is uh, with these Okay, it is uh, with this view that our Minister of Foreign Affairs has just been to Brussels, Oslo, and Helsinki, New York, where he had fruitful exchanges with his peers and private sectors and development partners. At the national level, I shall say that Gabon is committed to sustainable development with low uh, consumption of carbon energy and resilient through its strategic level. Uh, through its strategic development plan. Okay, so th thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, very uh, clear. And maybe if I can ask you to send the declaration also so we can read all of that, uh, which would be also very beneficial. Yeah. Let me conclude by inviting you to you to inviting the organizations present here as well as the countries which are here to attend this round table which will be organized in New York and bring their contribution to the African Initiative on Climate. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Well done. Now, uh, I have seen a couple of uh, over here. Gentlemen at the, at the back. No, no, you, you. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. My name is Xi'an. Um, I'm the ambassador of Maldives. Um, just wanted to highlight a few things about uh, you know, the, today's conversation. Of course, I'm not going to touch about the um, Talanoa dialogue, but this is one of the most you know, um, important uh, outcomes, if you can say, one of the few things that came out of uh, you know, Paris um, Accord as well. Um, if you look at this is one few forums where you bring the um, state actors and non-state actors. And I think this is a very important uh, um, aspect of, of, of uh, you know, our goal towards achieving um, our NDCs. So I think um, I would like to commend um, EU on that aspect. After having said that, um, I also want to touch upon um, renewable energy. Um, as you would know, um, most countries, you know, seeds especially, um, we contribute 0.03% of um, carbon emissions. But if you really look at um, the renewable energy um, endorsement or the adaptation that is taking place in seeds, it's, it's unbelievable. Even if you look at, I mean, last week I gave a keynote speech um, here at the same building, and one of the things we declared or we, we shared was 30% of electricity uh, within a few months, Maldives will be, um, you know, uh, um, based on renewable energy. But even if you look at other small island states, um, you are talking about 25, 30, 35%. Sadly, ironically, I mean, even though we adopt 100% renewable energy, there isn't anything that we can do. But this is the irony of it. But I thought, you know, this is a very important point to make here because I think we have um, state actors and non-state actors actually that can make a difference um, in our endeavor um, in order to overachieve um, um, the NDCs, I think, which will be critical in achieving the targets of Paris Accord. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Uh, Yes, thank you very much, Sandrine dixon de Clev. I'm representing E3G and Zinteo today. I want to commend the European Commission and those of you who have all been sitting on different panels today for talking about collaboration. I think at a time when actually we are faced with very little collaboration and a pushback not only on the Paris Agreement, but also in terms of trade and exchange of knowledge. I think this is a time when we need to listen very carefully to what Lydia has indicated around the need to take the signs of where we are progressing. So I have a specific question because I think one of the key blockages are exactly the just transition. And we've heard from Montserrat and others, including our colleague from Canada, that there are efforts to try to look at the social and climate implications from an economic perspective to ensure that actually we can create the paradigm shift that we need. And so I, I'd like to see if some of the, the panel members, in, in particular um, our representative from ITUC, who is doing some amazing work in this area, but also the representative from Canada, and also um, UNEP and, and David Turk, could reflect a little bit on what more we need to do to ensure that the energy transition and the, and the climate transition can be very much a social guarantee of jobs, growth, and a better economy. Thank you. I have seen one young lady at the back, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Aide Saucedo, and I am from Mexico. Uh, I would like to know from your own point of view, how can the European Union can strengthen non-state actors from developing countries to tackle climate change? Thank you. And one more question, the lady at the back. Thank you very much, Pascaline Gabory, pilot for DEV. In our organization, we try to combine questions of climate and development. We are in contact with many uh, entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, uh, who are skilled, innovative, and who want to invest in the environment. But still, they are confronted to questions of access of ba to basic services and sustainable infrastructure. So my question is, how can this uh, talent Talanoa dialogue bring to more solidarity in terms of also integration of the SDGs, implementation of the SDGs, and especially SDG 12 uh, for a more responsible production and consumption. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. I think we, we have facilitated everyone, and now we are back to, to this table, and where should we start? There was a number of questions and some, some declarations, some comments. So I would suggest that if we have something to say on, on some specific issues, so uh, we'll go just person by person, and it will be the most easier. So I, I would like to ask you to start the discussion or the answering. 
Thank you very much. I'm not going to try and answer all the questions. I'll just pick on, on a couple. One is the sustainable, public proc sustainable procurement question. Um, in order to be able to make that attractive, you need to do a couple of things. One is to start getting the, the change in behavior and the change in understanding of issues, which of course requires advocacy. It requires addressing the whole fossil fuel subsidies and other subsidies which exist in the mispricing, because that will enable you to see much better what is it that you're saving on. You need to think in terms of the life cycle costs, because if you take the life cycle costs, then you will see that it is a much cheaper option. Uh, and uh, you know, if you bring all of these together, then sustainable procurement makes sense. And I think a lot of the work that we're doing, and I would encourage you to go to our website to see some of the examples of what is it that you can do to break exactly those bottlenecks that you're mentioning. With regard to the question of, uh, of um, SIDS, as well as Sandrine's question on uh, the link between climate actions and social transformations, you know, renewable energy, we talk about it mostly in terms of climate change, but really we also need to understand the implications this is going to have to a social transformation in terms of a decentralized power, decentralized energy, decentralized geopolitics. You will have a completely different situation when you have a large number of, of suppliers who are supplying and a large number of, of buyers who become also suppliers, the prosumers. And so you're going to be able to see a difference. I'm not going to touch the just transition. I'll leave it to my colleague. But just to say that renewable energy has the power to change geopolitics. And that, to the SIDS question, it, it will, uh, you know, uh, it may not solve for you the adaptation question, the vulnerability question, but it changes the larger geopolitics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dave, maybe now you, you would like to take over? Yeah, thanks for the excellent question. So let me just pick up on a, a few of them. First to the question of uh, climate and development, the SDGs, how do we integrate all of those very important objectives? It's frankly one of the reasons we went from a climate-only scenario to a climate and air pollution and energy access. We're adding water in this year to make sure that um, we're looking at these in an integrated fashion. And what we found when we did the integrated analysis with climate and air pollution and access is there's actually relatively few trade-offs. You can actually achieve these objectives if you're smart about it from the government policy side of things. And I think there's a lot of interesting insights that can be gained by looking at these in an integrated fashion. Um, secondly, to the um, point on non-state actors, including in the emerging world or the developing world, I completely agree. That's a huge um, opportunity space and a lot of, uh, obviously we talked already and heard about a lot of development assistance funding from the uh, Europeans, from Canada, from other countries. That's an incredibly important uh, space to invest in. I know we're working more and more with a variety of different uh, non-state actors, NGOs around the world, an incredibly import important motivator. Um, and then just to uh, the question on um, just transition um, and how do we, uh, Sandrine's question, um, I think it's useful to think it's not just the energy transition that's happening, it's also digitalization that's happening, it's globalization. There's a lot of forces out there, which makes it even that, frankly, that much more complicated. And that's why having just transition part of every discussion, those kinds of issues, absolutely key to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball and think about what matters the most, which is the people of the world, um, as opposed to anything else. And then just lastly, just to commend the leadership, I think it's incredibly impressive what some of the SIDS, some of the island uh, nations are doing in terms of renewable rates, in terms of not only working on adaptation, but mitigation, even though it's an incredibly small amount and percentage of emissions compared to the European Union or China or US or other um, bigger players. And um, I think that leadership matters, and it matters because it's not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk. And I think it puts pressure, frankly, on everybody else to, to do their part um, because there is a larger part on the mitigation side of things. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much. So maybe Ambassador, we'll go down the row. <laughs> okay, um, I guess I'll take. I'm interested in in the the question about um, the just transition. I, I'd like to say that I think um, one of you know came out very clearly in our national dialogue, the ongoing national dialogue in Canada, uh, is that we we simply have to protect. Uh, we have to both protect our environment, you know, and, and along with that, meet meet our Paris uh, targets and grow the economy. We, we, we can't treat this as, a, as one or the other. Um, otherwise, we, we simply can't do it. I mean, we, uh, that's sort of a premise that frames everything we do. We, we, we couldn't maintain our domestic consensus without uh, a concern for, for, for growing the economy and for jobs. 
Um, we're a very decentralized country, and without that national consensus and national framework, it, it simply won't go forward. Um, so we have to maintain that dialogue to do that. And I have to say, without that, the prosperity that engenders, we won't be able to meet our international commitments and, and engage in the kind of leadership we would like to aspire to, along with the EU internationally, in supporting uh, our partners across the world, the developing world, and so forth. Um, I, so that, that's where I think, uh, that, that includes trade, by the way. I think we, we, uh, you know, we're seeing concerns about trade, but I think trade is part of the solution. We have to see it that way. Um, we have to, of course, have the evidence and, and look at, at the means, but we, we, to maintain growth, um, we simply have to keep our markets open, and that means for open for lower carbon imports, open for sharing of technology, open for um, you know, the, the kinds of uh, growth and, that will spur competitiveness, innovation, uh, and technology that we're going to need. Um, so I, I think the answer is that we have to keep the dialogue going because we can't move forward unless we move forward together in, in broad consensus. And that's trite, but it's true. It's true at the macro international level, but it's also true, uh, I think, in any local community. And that's where I, I think it's, it's really good to step back and look at the broader strategic context of uh, what we're living in. You know, people out there are anxious. The populists are still, in many places, on the rise. This, uh, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau said to our ambassadors meeting just two weeks ago, the pace of change has never been faster, but it will never be this slow. It's, it's, uh, we have to adjust to that as the new normal. It's mostly technology, right, and digitization and what that's doing to the economy, but there's also clearly a, a rebalancing of global power. Sh shifts are underway. This leaves people anxious. We need to engage them. We need to engage those with whom we disagree. We need to listen. We need to create the space in which the, the recognition that listening provides allows the possibility of consensus and common cause and moving forward uh, at all levels, at all levels, not just national governments, obviously, subnational cities, but all stakeholders, especially non-traditional stakeholders who feel left behind. So I, I think that's, that's all I can say, it, it, that we, we are committed to to doing that, and that's as we look ahead at the international meetings and, and, and Katowice, I think we, we have to say the same thing. Yes, there might be things we disagree about, there might be divisions, but we've got to keep uh, our minds on that broader strategic frame that says we are in the boat. What did you say? We're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. We are in this together, and the most important thing is to create that space where we see this as a common challenge that requires a common approach. So let's disagree, but let's never forget that. Otherwise, we're really, truly lost. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, two things. Um, the first one uh, is that we do not discuss fossil fuels in WTO. In fact, we are not discussing anything in WTO. Uh, so trade is not, is not making us, is separating us and, and probably uh, we do not speak about trade because I don't think that Argentina first will be good for the world. So having said that, I would like to address the, the question of the leadership. Let's say all of us, we mentioned the leadership, but it is, is, it is important to understand what leadership is. Leadership is not pushing, it's pulling. Leadership means generosity with the smaller. Leave your interests behind and try to help the other. So uh, leadership means partnerships. So we need to understand that we, when we developing countries are asking for leaders, we are asking for people to hear from us what we need and why and how we want to go forward. We need to respect each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. No, just quickly to take off from the leadership perspective and maybe here also to salute what the Gabon has announced uh, as a small country uh, and developing country have been able to contribute 10% of the budget uh, and waiting for the others to join. So I'm happy, uh, I, I hope I'll be happy to hear soon that others have joined and contributed to this budget or the UNDP. So we'd like to thank them. But I think the question quickly on how do we uh, match what we're doing here and the SDGs, again, bring us back to the NDCs. The NDCs, at the platform where we are committing to transform our commitment into action. So there we have to look into it. Say, somebody was saying, soon we should not have any more Minister of our Environment going to the COP meeting. We should have Minister of Planning and, and Finance going there because they should be the one 
from our countries being able to factor all those commitments into national planning and, and development. So we have to work on that. We have to see it. I mean, uh, uh, to agree with the ambassadors, uh, DG Klima is here. I'm sure I've seen DG Defco, but we need to see DG Trade also here. Actually, we are DG Trade building, so we have to be able to get them down and come here and sit with us and so have this discussion all together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now maybe. Yes, uh, I think it was a specific question addressed to us, no? Of course, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to listen to uh, the, the mention of the right to develop because in our opinion, one of the main elements of just transition, one of the main elements of we want to lead this movement is to the solidarity. Because we, as I said before, we, we cannot let no one behind. And that means, as I said before, investment. And more investment when, when more is needed. Our colleague from Greenpeace talks about the historical debt duty that we have for to be the the, the historical polluters, no? But as, as I say before, you ask me what we can do. I think that one of the main elements that we are proposing as a trade union is we want to anticipate because future is now. We cannot use the past for to avoid the future. And we are telling the commission, we are telling everywhere where we go, not only at European level, also at global level, because we think global, because we are a global movement and we want to anticipate. There are a huge number of jobs that could be created at European level and at world level if we put in place the necessary political measures, investment skills, but also the possibility to, uh, to provide hope to the citizens and to the workers. Because if you go to a miner, if you go to Stara Segura, if you go to uh, Katowice and you say, we have alternatives and you will have a good job, you need to be prepared, you need to receive the necessary training for to afford this job will be different that uh, if you go and you say your mind, your company, your, your will be closed tomorrow and we don't have expectations for you, no? I think that the best is to anticipate and we have a lot of sectors that this anticipation ca can have a lot of positive, uh, a lot of positive uh, results like in construction, in agriculture, in transport, and, and we are providing those solutions, means trade unions at uh, European level, we are trying to lead these proposals, those proposals, and one of the materialization uh, is this just transition and decent work uh, ministerial declaration that we are delivering, we are offering as a trade union movement to the governments that will be uh, deciding uh, the level of if we go faster, if we don't go faster, but the ambition must be aligned and must be accompanied by those measures. But solidarity <coughs> principle for our proposals. Thank you. Thank you. No, very briefly, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there was no question specifically directed to me, but I did want to add my voice uh, to um, ASG for ACP in thanking uh, the ambassador of Gabon. I believe that was her statement with a colleague. Um, and I would uh, really much encourage that you circulate uh, the declaration exactly. because it is not just Gabon's declaration. Um, uh, as the statement indicates, that Gabon is the spokesperson or the leader of the whole AU on the issue of climate change, and I would, I would, I would, I would um, uh, support that and encourage that. But uh, secondly, I think I think it's important. The point has been made, even as we speak about just adaptation, um, to link the whole process of uh, um, uh, fighting climate change to the right to development, I think it has been said. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the end result of this, it is about development. Uh, it is about sustainable development. And I think it is important that we don't lose sight of that. Um, the primary best effects of climate change and ensure that our people are able to find jobs, are able to find, um, you know, uh, um, food security, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important element that needs to be uh, factored in and be looked into. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but we have emphasized, for us as Africa and developing countries to be able to engage in climate action, we do need to be assured of uh, 
the means of uh, of implementation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Marco now. Uh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, three short points. First, I mean, I would very much like to underline that that I mean, this will only be a success when we when we achieve and when we succeed in the collaboration. And this goes, of course, for the for the climate action, and of course, this also goes for for trade. And let me underline what Daniel said. I mean, trade is part of the answer, and it's part of the solution. But of course, it must be uh, rule-based trade. I mean, we need the trade where it's not the larger pulling the smaller ones. We need a trade where, um, and I think, well, Marcelo has talked about leadership, where, where the leaders listen to the others. Uh, so, so I think this is what we need. But, but under these conditions, trade is very much part of the answer, because otherwise we will not get there and will not spread the technology. Um, the second point is on, on, on history. Well, um, we are, and as I said, we are committed that, that Europe needs to be ambitious and, and Europe needs to continue to, to, to be one of the leaders of this process. This is very clear. Uh, at the same time, I mean, the figures are clear. I mean, we'll be 5% in 2030. And the truth is also whatever we do, I mean, this will not be enough for, uh, for, uh, for assuring that we uh, succeed in a global problem. But, but I, 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 I even agree that it's okay to, to continue to challenge those who work hard to uh, live up to their, to, their, uh, to, their, uh, to their commitments. But at the same time, I would also encourage you to also back up the right trees, meaning the US government, our Chinese friends, and so on. But we are committed. But again, I mean, we need a global uh, answer to a global problem because otherwise this will not go anywhere. And the third point, tomorrow I go to London again, uh, and there is even a parallel to Brexit. Uh, and uh, the parallel is this is all about investment. And in order to continue to have investment or to trigger the investment we will need to do this transition, we need a certain amount of certainty, which for the time being we neither have in Brexit nor in this process. So, so again, I would like to underline once again Let's get this Paris rule book done in order to provide for the minimum certainty we will need to, to trigger this investment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the very end of our uh, discussion. And I, I, I would like, first of all, to thank the panelists and the keynote speakers for a very interesting discussion. And for those who took the floor, I should have said that I have seen a lot of different stakeholders over here, not only the big ones, but I have seen the small communities and I have seen the farmers and their cooperatives. So we have a lot and different representations over here, even the smallest NGOs and, and the big associations. So we are all present here. And as Ambassador said, we already had that discussion. The only reason why we are here is because we are sitting in the same boat. And the thing is, we are going one direction. Now the, the problem is we should stop that boat a little bit because we are going too fast. And if we all serious and if we all make that extra effort, it's going to be stopped, it's going to happen. But it's up to us and not only the big uh, companies, not only the governments, but also even we, in our opinion, said that even the small communities and, and all the action that they're creating, if they're replicated and if there are a lot of different actions like that, it can make an impact. Small and medium enterprises, uh, small businesses, small farmers, everyone can put their effort and can make a difference. Small communities, small municipalities, not only the big cities. So we are all here, and I am glad to see that we are all here in the hall. So it's thank you very much, Commission, for, for, for this initiative. And, and uh, I'm hoping that the Commissioner Kanyete will bring this uh, discussion feedback also further up. And I'm hoping that there will be some sort of proposal uh, on, on how to promote that. Uh, Talanoa dialogue, but at the same non-state action in general, how to be more ambitious. And uh, we also will have a good discussion in the, um, the COP24 in Katowice. A number of us already mentioned that, and there will be more non-state action uh, discussion. 
And uh, we are all very much uh, committed and will do our best. And I was very ha happy to hear a lot of enthusiasm. And we were discussing growth, green growth, and economical growth. We were not talking negative. We, there is so much positiveness in there. So also with that spirit, I would like to finish up. And the good news is now is the lunch break. And the lunch will be served outside. But please come back over here at 2.30, <laughs> because you'll miss another very interesting panel discussion. So thank you very much, and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.